How are you? Hello, bonjour. Nice to talk to you. What's that behind you on the wall? It's a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> This is a Buddha abroad from Tibet. This is like book covers, sci-fi book covers, Frank Herbert, called uh, Dune. That's my office. Uh, my name is Ludwig Mohamed. Aha, uh -huh. what an interesting name. So yeah, you're thank German you. and Iranian, huh? <laughs> Almost. I'm French. I was born and raised uh, in Algeria. Oh, yeah. And may I know your name? My name is Nell. For French-speaking people, it's too short. When I'm in France, people prefer Nelly Elizabeth. Very elegant. <laughs> Thank you. You're a writer, huh? I'm doing research and I write books and scientific articles and I mm -hmm. give trainings, conferences, seminars. I'm kind of a grassroots researcher, let's say. I see. I used to be a scholarly researcher writing scholarly books. I started again. I, I went back to school. I got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in painting. I don't belong anywhere. I never did. Yes, yes. That's something I could say also because I'm between grassroots and research and mm -hmm. psychology, theology, anthropology. Oh I've done a, a master's degree in uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure, which is like... A, yes, I understand. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Means you're a hot shot. <laughs> and then I've done a, a PhD in anthropology anthropology and a PhD in psychology. Oh my gosh. And I was like, yeah, but university might be too too tight. In yes. France, if you go beyond certain borders, you know, it's not science anymore. Yes. You spend more time trying to explain who you are instead of explaining what you do. So mm -hmm. may I ask you, where do you live? <laughs> right now, I am in the Adirondack Mountains of far northern New York State. I also live in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, we have uh, a year-round house. We, we did two weeks of quarantine. Uh, we started walking on a, an unpaved mountain road, and we would drive our car with New Jersey license plates to get to this road. Our neighbors started telling us that people were asking questions about us. Mm -hmm. And then one time, a neighbor shouted at us, get out of here and so you know it's like we were terrible summer people when you talk about summer people it's like the stereotype of rich white people and i'm a black person so it's kind of strange you know to be um have pitchforks out uh against me as a summer person so i actually bought a little used jeep with new york plates so i'm yeah. kind of undercover as a local, as undercover as I can be in myself. <laughs> so anyway, that's where I live. Well, that's and very interesting. What, when people think of me, they think of a writer. And I make artists' books, I illustrate. That's another way in which I don't really have a home. Uh, too much of a writer to be an artist and too much of an artist to be a writer. <laughs> so tell me about stereotypes. and. And my work is is turning around that concept yes. of identity, who we are, um, yes. and yeah. how individuals are considered to be part of sexual, ethnical, religious minorities, and sometimes linguistic minorities, yeah. especially with uh, what you said, I'm black, and this is the stereotype about summer people and so on. That's very interesting because yes. hold, especially hold where on. I come just, from. Just, just one second. Yes, dear? Yeah. Okay. My husband forgot I'm busy. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm very much interested into how people are dealing with the norm. What is, you know, as you said, with that used chip, how they, do they use uh, certain tools, ideological identity tools, to, to get undercover and to be able to negotiate yes. easily? <laughs> right. I, uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't thought of my Jeep as uh, an identity tool but that's terrific it's like okay yes. guys you have a very very interesting stereotype about myself that i didn't think about but let's negotiate you know if it's yeah. easier for you with new york uh, plague instead of uh, new jersey, new jersey. One. yeah still also crossing that factor of minority with sexuality and gender yes. being a woman being homosexual being 
um, transgender and so on. Mm -hmm. If you come in also from an ethnical or religious minority, how do you double negotiate that norm? Is it easier? For some people it is because once they understand how it works, yes. then it's easier for them to, you know, to adapt to different networks and different uh, political dynamics. But for some people it's even harder. Um, because it's what I see up to now, maybe it's going to change, but it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, yeah. we, we're hearing even more stereotypes. So, for instance, there's that um, ID circulating uh, at the left, you know, identities and gay prides and, um, and so on uh, became slowly but surely another racist weapon used against African and Muslim uh, communities uh, in France, like you guys, you oh, don't talk. Oh, right, right, right. You're anti-feminist. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. They're all barbarians. Yeah. They're all patriarchal. They don't know anything mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. those issues mm -hmm. because they're coming mm -hmm. from African backgrounds. You mm -hmm. know? The answer of certain activists was to adapt certain con certain concepts about uh, essentialization of gender. Sure. To be a white man like this, you have to be a white woman like this, but yes. nothing in between and nothing for other, you know, my, uh, ethnic or religious yeah. mind. So this has become also a weapon used mm -hmm. by certain left-wing um, activists answering to uh -huh. Eric Zemmour and to others, telling yeah. them, no, but that concept of, you know, we have to decide uh, what which category do we belong to. Uh, to. Uh, are we a woman, a man, a gay, a transgender? This is also part of the Western uh, intellectual colonization. I think that certain concept uh, about deconstructing identity, mm -hmm. white, black, slavery, colonization, homosexuality, very important. And when I hear the word community, I hear it almost as a hard word, a word that wants to corral people within identities that are, well, simple. At the same time, I know that you need community to keep people talking and keep people encouraged. On the other hand, community can work to simplify, not just regional or national or generational, but also sexual orientation. And uh, in the United States, you need to add bodily integrity or uh, challenges, uh, disabilities as well. If we are always fragmented into um, the community that is recognizable, the disability community, the mm -hmm. trans community, that's, that I think tends to tamp people down. I mean, it's a place to start though. It's a place to start. Yeah. With that yeah. huge diversity that we have yeah. here, uh, we created a, a network called Houses, the Houses of Inclusion in Marseille. The English word houses? Houses, but with an A, you know, because French people would say houses. Yes. <laughs> How do you spell so it? A O Z I Z. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's working on gender, ethnicity, disability, art, also dancers. And you know, we, we submitted to the Pride, for example. And they were like, okay, but who are you? <laughs> who are you? It's like they didn't get it. It was yeah. too much of a community and, and not a community for them. So so that did that's they finally exactly get it? it? Uh, still not, I think, but they did accept us to be part of them so which is like a the beginning of a, a success yes. i guess everything is such a struggle i used to teach at the university of north carolina in chapel hill the black faculty and student groups which i belong to and supported would tend to include prayers which was totally antithetical to me and i'll bet you run into that kind of thing in your work as well that people want to bring religion into situations where for you or maybe for others it doesn't belong or it may be divisive i mean i can imagine in a multicultural place like marseille the whole question of Islam and Judaism must be oh! yes yes how do you deal with it uh, it's less problematic than in other big cities in France believe it or not because uh, because of that background you know very diverse background since the foundation of the city 2000 sure. years ago yeah. so it's easier to work on those topics than <gasps> it was in Paris where it became so uh, touchy to speak about diversity and yes. uh, if you speak about that it's like you you always find someone in front of you black white uh, yellow whatever that is gonna take it 
personally, you know. Yeah, that's why I, I started speaking out loud uh, more and more about inclusive representations of faith uh, traditions because uh-huh. in Algeria, I was studying to become an imam um, uh-huh. in a Salafi madrasa, in a Salafi school. I was yeah. coming from a family that was more into Sufism, mysticism, yes. Yes. something something very peaceful and inclusive yes. and tolerant, not yes. perfect, a bit patriarchal, but not as much as the mm-hmm. Salafi mm-hmm. dogmatic tradition mm-hmm. coming from Saudi Arabia, you know, the yes. 50s yes. Uh, independence. It helped at a point. Now it turned to be a, a long-term poison, even for those societies who produced mm-hmm. that dogmatism, you know, very radical, fascistic yeah. representation of yeah. Islam. Yeah. And in the 70s, we had the idea that we are not Africans, we are Arabs, just because we've been colonized by Arabs, you know, and we are Muslims, especially after the 62 independence, where they put, unfortunately, everyone out, yes. including Jewish, Algerian backgrounded yes. people, because yes. they said, oh, you accepted yes. the French yes. nationality. Of course, you know the history. French yes. government at that time in early 19, uh, 20th century did that to divide, yes. you know? Yes, yes. But, you know, it was a problem. It became like a poison also, not only like a political issue, but like mm-hmm. a a structural, uh, inner, dynamic poison for the Algerian uh, identity. Because yes. Yes. they started telling us we are Arabs, we are all Muslims, yes. uh, we yes. have to speak Arabic yes. at school from one year yes. to the other in the 70s, you know? Yes, and yes. Teaching math and physics and history, started teaching in Arabic, they didn't know how to do it. Mm-hmm. So we have to bring uh, teachers from Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Yes. And that's how they brought books of Arabic, but also books of dogmatism and political Islam oh, in their language. Yeah. So that's how we're starting to have that mainstream Islam in Algeria becoming a foreign, alien Islam, and also f- very fascistic Islam. Yeah, very So nat- that's what, yeah. very nationalistic, very patriarchal. So yes. at that time, When I came to France, I started asking uh, myself many questions about identity and sexuality, of course, and so on and so forth. So I kind of rejected very strongly faith and especially Islam aside. Uh Then I came back to it through Buddhism and meditation. Uh You know, it's so sexy, so peaceful. And then I've been to Tibet. I heard exactly the same BS, you know, about women and queer. And I was like, wow, that sounds so Islamic to me. (laughs) So... (laughs) Maybe, maybe it's not faith, maybe it's what is behind that facade, uh, social nationalism or communism or Islamism, but it's always the same problem. The underlying mechanisms of fascism are always the same. So that's how I started, you know, st- studying how, why fascistic ideologies are always tar- targeting minorities. And that was the basis of my, my research, you know. At that time, it was still very personal so i reintroduced faith uh, islamic practice of Ah. faith in my life very slowly but surely Ah. we founded in 2010 uh, a queer muslim organization uh, in france the first one and then we founded an inclusive mosques where gays and women could be imams and leaders of the faith uh, congregation and so on so it was like wow a big revolution in france as you can imagine because yes (laughs) Yeah. How could you be leaders? You don't even exist. So yeah. that's why I started to understand that faith could be used in a way for uh, a humanistic agenda. Yes. Personally and also ideologically, I made peace with that. Ah, uh, but yeah, it was a 20 years struggle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because it could be exhausting. Yeah? It is exhausting and it can drive you crazy. I don't think people should be expected to be on the activist front lines for more than 20 or 30 years yes, because yes, it's, yes. it's always such a minority of people who actually get things done. So the people who were doing things get overworked and burnt out. Burn out is a, an old friend. And, uh, beauty is uh, an important concept in race, of course. So in my book, History of White People, I actually have a chapter on uh, personal beauty as a scientific concept. And then there's the question of beauty in art. Looking at the, the card behind your head, and I said, oh, that is beautiful. If you were the person who made that, you might think, oh, that's a trivialization of my art, that it's just decorative. 
And so beauty can be kind of an insult in art. You need something much more activist or challenging. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. Very interesting because generally when they, they speak about art in France, most of them tend to consider that art doesn't need a purpose. It's done for itself. It doesn't need a purpose. Art for art's sake, I think now, it's less respectable among artists that engaged art is much more respectable, much more appreciated. And in these times that we are in, engaged art becomes even more prized. And especially for Black artists, your art has to critique racism, it has to critique white supremacy. And that can be kind of oppressive too. So we go back and forth between being able to see non-engaged art as well, like abstract art. In the 1970s, it was very difficult for a Black artist who was doing abstract art to be seen because engaged art was all there was to it. And the critics would approach Black art as if it were sociology. It's a hard line to walk in which you want artists to be creative, that art for art's sake is kind of airy-fairy, but then must all art be understood as sociology? So all this is going on in the way we think about art today. Um, yes, yes, and, and also academic research. Do you do research just to for the sake of, of science. That's what they told me when I defended my uh, anthropology thesis. Yes. And at the end, my teacher told me, you did a great job and they gave me the highest score. But they told me after two PhDs, they told me, you're still not a researcher. You're still an activist. What? Yes, ah. yes. <laughs> Do you have any difficulty publishing? So my latest book, let's do ah. some, some self solution here. <laughs> oh, beautiful. About, uh, Ooh. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, speaking about that same book with my former teacher, PhD uh, supervisor, she said, no, no, this is not objective. We could not publish that. You should not go that way because you're going to lose your career and they're going to come back to me because I trained you. Ah, it was like such a big issue for her. And now yes. you see it's published in one of the biggest <laughs> yes. the study university in the world. So Aha. yes, it's problematic in France because they don't speak the same language. You know what right. I mean? So Does your your group have a publishing arm yes yes we have like a tiny uh, publishing house but we are like publishing new authors yes trans, the trans identity that inclusive faith about uh fighting back against racism yeah. with sociology autobiography and inclusive faith perspectives mm -hmm. great it's well, by Isabella Hamad, and it's called The Parisian. The central figure is a Palestinian from Nablus who goes to France. It's during and after the First World War. One other book by Sadia Hartman, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiment, about the invisible working class Black women in Philadelphia and New York in the early 20th century. And she has spoken of it as a history. She's made up a lot of it, so I'm not ready to go with her as a history, but it's a fantastic evocation. I think it might be called a novel. It's absolutely gorgeous. Before Homosexuality, Huh. Uh, written by um, Khaled Arwayheb, uh, dealing with gender and sexual identities, minority identities uh -huh. in the Arab Muslim world before colonization uh -huh. and before that, you know, implementation of that binary mo uh, model, like yes. you're queer or yes. you're straight, yes. you're yes. white, you're black, yes. you're Western, you're Eastern. So yes. uh, before, it seems that we, we had so much more diversity, so much yes. more inclusiveness. Yes. Uh -huh. All right. Well, I think we've uh, we've met. <laughs> it was my first blind date. I was happy to share it with you. <laughs> Me too. I have never been on a blind date before. <laughs> Maybe one day we will meet again in the real world. In Marseille. You don't want to come to the U.S. now. You probably can't come to the U.S. now. But yeah. Welcome to Marseille. Anytime. Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs>